Hey, what's up? Ben's asking people to finish the assignment. How's everyone doing? Hey, what's up? Ben's asking oh, people to finish the assignment. How's everyone doing? You're hearing the double audio right there. Got everything up and going right now. Should be in the chat. Let me say, yo, people working on the assignment right now. Who's finished the assignment? Some logistic regression. We'll be talking about that here in just a moment. Let me put the code on the screen. Code on the screen. Code up to join the Kahoot. Who's going to join the Kahoot right here? Who's going to be first? What name will you have? Some review tonight. We'll go over here. Uh, interpretations at the end. So stay tuned. I've got a lot of videos to label. <laughs> been streaming all day answering emails between it so um little little delay on uh putting stuck on three to wrap it all up is three the check regression p values high logistic a good fit p values low logistic model bad fit so number three is i think it's number three right there's number three classification confusion matrix we went over a lot of them during office hours today message me on discord if you got questions Discord's popping off right now. A lot of people with Discord questions. But hop in. We'll get started here in two minutes. Put two minute timer on. Two minute timer. Yes. Well, you should be done. I mean, you should be done soon. No, like you should be done. <laughs> no, but like, congratulations. Great work. You should be done soon. You're wrapping it up, getting ready to finish it. Just like put a bow on it. Done. Send it off. Good to go. Simon almost finished up. So, no, excellent work. Great job. And uh, get the assignment done. Finish the review quiz. Be working everything. <laughs> lovely hamster. That's awesome. Let me see the names in the background right here. Got lovely hamster, champion goose, captain alpaca, kind frog, purple hawk, amiable echidna. I don't know how that thing is said. Rapid sea lion. I'm going for rock star boa though. I mean, shining hamsters. We got shining hamster versus lovely hamster. Stiff competition right there. Oh, we lost someone. Who did we lose? Where did we get? Did Bo we lose boa? We got Rockstar Boa still. We'll be starting here soon. One minute left. One minute. And we'll watch soccer here. Euros have been crazy today. Is it? Is it? Uh, is it the World Cup? World Cups what every four years, or two years, or maybe it's every year. Maybe they do the World Cup every year. People, big soccer fans. Uh, soccer as a kid, I should have realized how good soccer is for you, like running around. Uh, which is funny because I did like track and cross country, but I wasn't a soccer player. Uh, a lot of our best cross country players were like soccer players. I remember this one kid, Matt, in our school was like top tier soccer player, but he was also like top tier cross country player. I mean, who would think that someone who's really fast would be good at soccer and cross country? I mean, like, what? Just, just, I would have never guessed it. It was really funny to me. Last little story here before the timer runs out. Got 15 seconds to tell it. As well as in high school, uh, one of the coaches for the basketball team ran up beside me. I was like, just doing my run. And he's like, hey, you're Brian Stevens, right? I was like, yeah, what's up? And he was like, you want to play basketball? And I was like, I'm not good at basketball. And he's like, you're 6'3", you're in shape. And I was like, yeah, but I'm really bad at basketball. And he's like, well, and I'm like, no, nah, I'm, I'm really bad. You, you don't understand. It doesn't matter that I'm in shape. <laughs> it doesn't matter that I can run. <laughs> I have no coordination. I'm bad at basketball. Let's throw out some 100 points. Welcoming everyone here tonight. Our tennis team demolished cross country when we jokingly joined. Wait, what? Is that true, Rose? Your tennis team, is that true? Are you saying like your tennis team decided to join up and do cross country and then your your tennis team was just like amazing at cross country? If so, that is awesome and congratulations. I love me some cross country. I think my top time was 1712, I think, I think. One of these days I might run a 5k again and hope to break 20. I mean, I'd love it if I went like sub 19, but I mean, that's what I was aiming for back in high school. But with that, let's get started here. Let's start talking about some new material. Now we're going to be talking about a lot of concepts tonight. We might hop into some uh, output. Tennis is a lot of fun. I do like tennis more. Like everyone's got their favorite sports. Whatever sport you love the best, whether it be shuffleboard, whether it be curling, whatever sport you love, that's you. Do you? I like me some tennis. Tennis is fun to play. My mom would give us like 20 bucks if we'd win against her as a kid. I don't think I ever got that $20. Maybe I can beat her now. She's like 70. <laughs> and mom, let's play tennis. 40-year-old son versus 70-year-old mom. I'm going to win this time. Here we go. In three, two, one. Let's go. Hoot. Here we go. I need that $20. <laughs> Speaking of prizes tonight, $20 first prize, $10 second prize. What is multi collinearity? She'd probably win. What is multi collinearity doing? 
Multicollinearity is going to show us what? I love this question. Our coach made us run laps around the cross field for two hours every time we accidentally left a single ball on any court. So we would all join the XC team during off season. So we'd wreck them. Oh, that's awesome. That's a good way to get in shape to like be really quick. A lot of cardio. Cross country is all about how fast can you run that 5K or 10K in college. So multicollinearity is a bad thing. The w how do we analyze multicollinearity? Like what output lets us look at multicollinearity? Let's just talk about multicollinearity here for a second. We'll look at the winners here in a moment. Uh, but how can we, I'm gonna make sure I don't, I don't know what I have up now right now. I'm just going to a new screen. New screen. How can we analyze that multicollinearity? Some variance inflation factor, you bet. And multicollinearity is a bad thing. It does not invalidate the model. These are keynotes you should have. Multicollinearity is the shared variation among the X's. It's how X's explain X's. And we don't want that. Uh, so if I have a model stored and we look at the VIFs, ooh, what is the lowest VIF possible? And the answer would be one over uh, one minus R squared. And it's R squared sub I technically. Uh, so it's R squared sub I. Cool, that's got it. So the lowest R squared sub I you can actually get is an R squared sub I of zero. And so the lowest VIF you can get is a VIF of one, which means there's no inflation. So if it's one, that means there's no multicollinearity, i.e. we see no overlap in the way that X's explain X's. This is literally when you create a model to explain an X variable from your other X's. I think we use A for it now. So we'd have a here this value plus uh, the coefficient of the first X in the model times the first X. We're not actually gonna solve this, but you can see right here, you would make a model building from how is X and that'd be A to the K times X to the K. You're making a model here explaining an X variable and this will get you an R squared sub I, which is not a good thing. The higher the R squared sub I, and we can show this, like if you get an R squared sub I here of 90%, what would be your variance inflation factor? Like hypothetically speaking, if we have an R squared sub I, like 90% of the variation in this X is explained by the other X's in the model, which this would just be the ith X, whatever it is. Uh, that's why it's called R squared sub I because it's for just any X in the model. What would be the variance inflation factor here due to exactly be 10? Because all we're doing is plugging it in right here and then you get 10, which means we have 10, our inflation of uncertainty is about 10 times more. We have about 10 times more uncertainty. It gets really bad if you go up here and you can see what this starts to approach. As it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, um, it'll approach a limit. Or do you not know how to do mathematics anymore? Because I think I'm better at calculating mathematics than you are if you're going to say that. R, you need to learn some math, man. That is just weird. I do not know. Maybe my R is possessed or something. I don't know why it's rounding that. Wait right there, Blake. Uh, what question do you have, Blake, right there? And I don't know why R is being all weird today. But yeah, R is having a hard time with big numbers. That's really weird. And I don't know. I maybe need to redo my R or look into something why it's being weird. Because I don't like that. Um, but what's going to happen right here is variance inflation is a bad thing. And the larger, wouldn't it be 0.1? So it's going to be, when you solve out the bottom right here, you're going to get 1 over 1 minus uh, 0.1. So that, yeah, yeah, you see it, Blake. Blake, 20 points. Blake, throw those questions, man. I think you saw it. You're, you're solving the bottom. Blake, 20 points. Thank you for asking that. You're solving the bottom, and then the bottom is going to get smaller, which makes the, since the denominator is getting smaller, it's going to make a ratio there that's bigger. So yeah, that's exactly right there. And we, we would figure out if this model is high multicollinearity by looking at a model dependent standard. I don't think I'm doing a quantitative Y right now. So we can't use a model dependent standard. So we'd have to go to our model. Let's do classic height being explained by weight and GPA data equals, and we'll do desired, but also survey 10. We'll do the next question here in a moment. And then we can look at our model for our dependent standard. And a high variance inflation factor here would be 1.56 uh, right here. And our variance inflation for this model is calculated to be low. Meaning our X's do not overlap in the variation they explain. But a good way to destroy this is to add in desired weight. And think about this. Desired weight and somebody's weight probably share a lot of the variation. Our model dependent standard now on high VIF is 2.6. But if you take a look at the VIFs, 
uh, we are seeing some violations where we see too much overlap between what the X's are doing. And a large component of it probably comes from the collinearity, how two variables explain each other, not the multivariate relationship. But who feels like they understand VX pretty well? We've gone over them pretty well in depth, especially here and previously. But variance inflation factor is witnessed, um, is found through multicollinearity, or multicollinearity can be described by variance inflation factor, which is not a good thing. It's the shared variation of the X's, which makes our model get really confused because it's like, we're inviting things to the party that do the same thing. What's going on here? Let's invite new things. Speaking of new things, let's go to a new question. See who's in the lead. 20 bucks on the line, $10 second prize, Stellar Owl. Oh man, got a cool name like that, Stellar Owl. Owl. Can't even say your name. He's so cool. Let's see who's going to win here with the next question. Here we go. True or false? Variance inflation is a good thing. Should be super easy right here. Variance inflation is a good thing. Please, no one hurt me with that wrong answer right here. We've already reviewed this. Variance inflation is a good thing. Variance inflation, variance is standard error squared. Standard error is uncertainty. That's the answer. Do you want more uncertainty? True, I want more uncertainty. False, I don't want more uncertainty. Variance, which is standard error squared. Oh no! Uh, I don't know what I'm gonna hit. It's all right if you got it wrong. We, we wanna make sure we understand that variance inflation means we've added extra uncertainty to our estimates. Standard error is variance uh, squared. If you square standard error, you get variance. So we can square root the variance. Big hint, a lot of people remember that from the assignment. Um, about how much extra uncertainty do we have in our estimate of weight? Just round it. Our estimate of weight has about how much extra uncertainty, like a, by a factor of about how much. Just round it. I think you see what I'm trying to get at right here. Because if it's variance inflation, just you know, do the do the square root thing. If you were just interpreting that, so oh, we've got about about two times more uncertainty. And that's what the variance inflation factor is telling us, because it directly relates to the uh, standard error. So the standard error is our measure of uncertainty. And you can see the uncertainty right here. And this is about two times bigger in about. It's an estimate. It's an estimate. It doesn't mean we know it's two times bigger. So let's just divide it by two. It means, and what plus, it's just our uncertainty. It's like we have this much extra uncertainty. And what does uncertainty do? It's going to make our confidence intervals wider. What happens when our confidence intervals get wider? They might be more likely to include zero. Now, we're lucky these are still significant. But when you have wider confidence intervals, they cover a greater set of values. And if a confidence interval, like we go to confidence intervals for the model, if a confidence interval were to contain zero, which this does not, this does not, this does, that instantaneously, and see we're covering extra topics right now, the p-value for this variable, GPA, must be what? Since we're looking at a confidence interval for the coefficient of this in the model, the p-value for GPA, and I'm throwing another 20 points. Thank you, Kirsten, Trace, everyone answering questions. Uh, you take square root, yep, Preston, exactly. And it's not statistically significant. So Preston's pointing out, if you want to know exactly how much uh, it's been increased, here we can just run the variance inflation again. Our increase to the uncertainty, really? Autocomplete, you just want to do that right there? Uh, we can square root this. I'm going to ask a random question right now. Who feels a lot better about their R usage from the first day to now? Like when you're using R, who feels a lot more like using R is a lot easier? I know like first day, first week, it's like, oh my gosh, this R thing. Ah! And now you're like, yeah, just hop in. Okay, I got it, I got it. Who's feeling a lot better like they're coding? Me, Aisha, that's so great to hear. Kirsten's saying me. Me, definitely Ivan's saying. I'm so glad you're Blake saying 100%. Me just screams right right there. Just yes, yes. Feeling good. I'm I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it where people are sending me their code and stuff on Discord and everything. They're like, hey, here's my code. I say, hey, you got the problem right here. They say, oh, they're like, I got it. I literally blew blew up my world week one as the group me. <laughs> oh man. Well, no, I'm really glad. And if you're taking 474, 475, we do we're gonna have a little bit of refresher in all those courses. We always start out with a refresher in our courses because we realize someone's skills might kind of decrease over time. Like Maybe someone took it a year ago. So we start with a little bit of a refresher in all those courses because uh, we want to get your R skills up to speed. We don't want to just jump you into the, throw you into the deep end. And you're like, I haven't swam in a year. And you're like, yeah, just remember to swim. Uh, I would like to understand loops more. 474 is where we, we go more in depth on loops. And loops are super important. Ask anyone who codes. And uh, so, and oh, Trace is pointing out, this does not bring new information. That's exactly what that P-value means. 
Great job, Trace, right there. That's what p-values mean in the multiple regression. GPA by itself might be significant. And so, yeah, take some 474. We're going to go more in-depth on loops. We're also going to go how to write code. So if you're looking to write functions, which is something I really love doing, I love making my own functions. Um, and I think I, yeah, I coded. I'll show you one last thing right here. Two seconds. Uh, I showed this off during office hours, and then we'll do the next question right here. Where's my regression solver? Okay, so... I made this, and I think it's got everything in here working correctly. Okay. So I had to... So this is the all correlations code, and I had to go in and update it and create my own sort of list here at the end of it. So I had to store all of this right here and create a way a variable was sorted so that when... Uh, sure, save selected, whatever. So when this runs, I'm blank screen here, I'm going to load some data. This is something I created right here, which if you can't tell, I'm very proud of. You can't see it right now. Uh, but this right here allows you to investigate your data and look for certain variables and see the correlations. And it actually goes in here and highlights significant correlations. So you can choose a Y variable of interest like GPA, and you can see if there's significant correlations. You can actually click here and just sort by p-value or whatever. But uh, yeah, you can even search through here and go to like GPA and just select that variable right there. And then you can look at the distribution of those variables. Uh, you can look at the scatter plot of those variables, all these things. And these are some of the things we'll be talking about. Oh, figure storage. I knew this thing had problems. I've been trying to fix that. So yeah, uh, that's something I developed right there. And I had to go in and recode it, recode the, uh, the all correlations. I had to make my own all correlations function. And you can see how I'm doing that right here. There's also for loops throughout here like crazy. So for loops are super important. So let's get back here and do that next question. So some kind of cool stuff we'll be learning about in the future there. Who's in the lead? Is it still Stellar Owl? Ooh, Stellar Owl. Stellar Owl. I can't speak. Next question. Will they remain in the lead? Let's find out. Quiz question. The partial F test is used to do what? What is a partial F used to do? What is a partial F test used to do? And they'll talk about these other things here on the screen are, oh my gosh, who knows? Which actually all F tests do this. So you, you could answer what all F tests do. Um, yep. Well, I guess there's one specifically here for what an F test does. So here I'll ask this after the answer appears. Which color is what the F test does? Oh no! Which color is what the F test does? Which of these best represents uh, red, uh, green, or yellow? Best represents what an F test does, just like a full F test. The full F test is best representative of which color on here. The full F test is what. The full F test is best represented by which color. The full F test is best represented by which color on here. This is the full. Don't worry, don't worry. If you got it wrong, don't worry. I'm just making sure we know what each of these do. So if we look at what a full F test does, great job, Callan, right there. We're throwing 20 points. Do not worry about getting things wrong. This is just review. I'm throwing 40 points for Bla for Trace and Callan answering right there. Don't worry if you get it wrong. It's all about partial F is for comparing two models to see if we see a reduction in the SSE. So when we look at the full F test, here, let's go back over here to our untitled. Sure. Um, if we're looking at, well, this is gender, so let's go desired weight. I'm just going to go right here to classic uh, LM right here. Survey 10, LM. And if we look at the F test, then the F test down here, which this is the F test, is going to compare our model to the naive model, which has no variables. So the naive model, uh, we do see statistically significant decrease um, in the amount of variation uh, going from like the sums of squared error, going from the no variable model, the naive to our model. Now, if we do a partial F test, we could go right here and create our simple model, which is just a smaller model. And then we could go make a big model, which will still just be a crazy model right here. How many variables am I adding to the model right now? Who knows? Look at my code and just tell me how many variables have I added to the model right there. We'll make it nice and bigger so everyone can see. This is the effects test. Uh, it's kind of like an effects test. Effects test is usually reserved for like one variable. This, it, it can be used in an effects test is a partial F test. A partial F test is just comparing a smaller model to a bigger model. So the idea of like the term partial F 
<coughs> means you're going part of the way um, comparing. So when you look at this right here, you can see 17 extra coefficients were added. And the 17 extra coefficients are this craziness in here. There's 17 in here somehow extra. And, and this is all of them, total all of them. This will be all right here. The uh, tilde dot will be all of them. I guess you could say, except for the Y variable. So technically if Trace is saying all the variables except the Y, that is correct. And, uh, but it's all the other X variables. And we do see here that all the extra X variables do a significant decrease to the sums of squared error going from the two variable model all the way up here to what appears to be a 19 variable model. And I can know it's 19 variables because there's a 17 increase in variables and the reduction is statistically significant. A drop one will only look at the impact of the removal of one variable. So you can do the drop one, which will do an effect, uh, which handedness will be the one, only one to really care about right here. So drop one does a, oh wait, oh, I don't have the, I have a different model right there. Let me go to the complex. There we go. So, oh my God, look at this output. Okay, let's rerun it. Here we go. Uh, handedness is the only one we'd really care about right here. So the drop one is doing basically a for loop of partial Fs. Does that make sense there, Trace and everybody? The drop one is doing a for loop of partial Fs. Like it does a partial F on this, a partial F on this, a partial F on this, but we don't need to do a partial F on GPA 0 0.6095 because that 0 0.6095, um, is that, is this the right output? No, we never looked at it. 0 0.6095. If we go right here and we look, GPA 0 0.6095, because one variable can be removed in and out of the model. Why must we do a partial F on handedness? Why must we do a partial F on handedness? Last question right here. Why must we do a partial F on handedness? Why must we do a partial F on handedness? And I'm kind of answering it by highlighting this right here. It's not just because it's a categorical variable because gender is categorical. So it's not just because it's categorical. There's a specific thing about it right here that it has a difference. It is categorical, but we don't have to do a partial F on this one right here to know it's significant. We do have to do a partial F on this one because we're removing at least two things from the model. Um, so yeah, because we're going to take out these two things and look at a model with and without them. Does that make sense? So it is doing a partial F. So drop one algorithmically goes through and does a partial F on each one, but you don't need to do a partial F to remove one thing because, because the significance of one variable bringing new information can be viewed right there. And body piercings is just a quantitative variable that can be removed in and out. Gender uh, male comes from a two level categorical variable. So gender male can just be removed in and out for the significance of gender male. But handedness left right comes from a three level. We're missing ambidextrous as the reference level. And so ambidextrous has to be taken out as a total and looked at a model with and without ambidextrous, which we can look at right here for the overall impact of handedness. And the overall removal of handedness shows us that handedness does not bring with it new information. And that's why it says two right there. So the only one we really need to run a partial F on with the drop one right here is handedness because everything else just brings one variable, which could be just removed in or out. But as soon as you start removing two or more things, you got to run that partial F to see if you should be removing them. Let's find out who's in the lead. Keep asking those questions right here. Oh my gosh, it's anyone's game. It's anyone's game with this next question. Here we go, lovely hamster, lovely work. R squared adjusted is what? Quick answers right here. Oh my gosh, I hope I did this correctly. Do you know the answers? Do you know the answers? That's the answer. Do you know the answers? Woo! They're all right. Every one of them. A little put some 20 seconds. You're like, oh my God, which one do I pick? I don't know. Whoever clicked, quick, whoever clicked quickly got it right. So, yep. And, and why is there a star on the is less than R squared over here? Well, there's a star because in the rare instance, your R squared is one in that way, then the penalty term goes away. Penalty term is based on the unexplained or the coefficient of non-determination. You don't got to know that word. That's one minus R squared. R squared is technically coefficient of determination. So, but we just call it R squared. It's just percent of variation Y explained by the variation X or the model. Um, unless one exactly. And that's just, I, I don't like putting those rare, like gotcha questions on the test. Um, R squared adjusted can be negative. I almost went harder on the assignment do not interpret R squared. Um, 
Uh, I didn't put that on here. R squared really doesn't have an interpretation because it's not mathematically accurate to say it's the percent of variation Y explained by the variation X. It's just a fairer way to compare two models on their R squared to say, let's penalize them for the amount of variables and how well they're doing. And so we're just creating a way to look at R squared with a penalty. It can be negative, which really just blows people's minds because you can't have negative variation explained. Hence why there's no good interpretation. We're just going to use it to compare two models. It puts models on even playing fields. Like this model has a hundred variables. It's got an advantage. This model has one variable. Well, now they're on an even playing field and it's less than R squared in all instances, except when R squared is equal to one. I can't think of any other instances. Mathematically, this makes sense right here. Who was quick? The answer was Stellar Owl. Stellar Owl was like, click. I'm going quick. Should you be quick on this one? I don't know. Standard errors are what? The only thing you should think when you think standard errors are this. They're related to a lot of things. I mean, they'll be related to if something is significant or not. They'll be uh, related to how much they're inflated. <laughs> I've trained you on that one to know. I love it. I love those answers right there. Like it's uncertainty. That means when you look at a standard error and you see down here, uh, this residual standard error, this is just your uncertainty in the residuals, which is like, here's your residuals and more uncertainty. They're further away from the line. When you look at, this is your estimate of the slope, but you could be off by about this amount. That's your uncertainty. Like, ah, I think the slope is 60, negative 63. Yeah, but I could be off by about 10. What do you want your uncertainty to be? Very small. So we think the coefficient of gender male is about 19. Yeah, but we could be off by about 1.6. That means two individuals who are otherwise identical, uh, but one of them is male and the other is female. The individual who is male, uh, we would expect to have a desired weight of about 19, pound more, 19 pounds more than the female. And just, just think about that right there. Does that make sense with your world? If you have two people who are like the same height, the same weight, other random things like GPA, a lot of things that really don't matter here, not statistically significant, but these two people are otherwise identical. One is male and one is female. We basically expect the male to want to weigh about 20 pounds more than the female. That's what we're talking about here. So an interpretation of a coefficient right here. Remember to compare when you have an indicator variable, you have to compare it to the reference, like two otherwise identical individuals where one is gender male and the other is gender female. We would expect uh, the person who is gender male to... Um, to want to weigh 20 pounds more than the person who is female. Once again, this is based on a two level categorical X right here, where the reference level is female because it comes first alphabetically. We have right here two people who are otherwise identical, but differ in their height by one inch. The person who is one inch taller is expected to want to weigh 1.6 pounds more than the other person. Is this making sense? Who feels like they got these definitions down? You want to interpret a weird one? Interpret this. Let's put one minute on the clock. Let's see if we can throw out 100 points. One minute on the clock. Throw a little hacker man on the screen right here. One minute. Try to interpret. Try to interpret that coefficient down here on the bottom. You got it. Interpret that coefficient. We'll do a coefficient. We'll do cheat sheet coefficients that are cheat sheet interpretations at the end. This is a weird one. You're like, what? We're predicting desired weight. Like, it doesn't even make sense. It's like, sure. I just wanted to listen to the music. It's not like a whole weekend making that. <laughs> Two otherwise identical individual individuals, but one is left-handed. Oh, Blake, you're so close. Blake, you're missing one thing. Let's get another 50 points on that. You're so close. You're so close. So close, Blake. If that's three points, I'm, I'm almost wanting to give you 2.5 out of three. It's so close. So close, Blake. Blake, great job. Blake, I'm throwing 100 points just because Blake stepping out on that ledge right there, jumping off. And Blake, you're so close. What are you missing? Can anyone help out with Blake right here and tell them tell what they're missing? You're so close. Two individuals. There we go. Trace got it right there. Trace, Trace got it. Trace, and that's got the full points right there. Two individuals who are otherwise identical, where one is left-handed, indicator variable, and the other is ambidextrous. So that's, we got to compare it to the reference level. The one who is left-handed is expected to have a desired weight, and I think they're going to finish it off. That is four pounds heavier. No. <laughs> Look what you've done to us, William. Everyone's saying trash now. 
for two otherwise identical individuals that uh but remember so and here's the thing ivan this is an indicator variable so you want to do indicator compared to reference level does that make sense so whenever you see this little bit on the end right here where it has uh the level where it says like handedness and then this make sure to compare it to the reference we got it ivan we're gonna work on that at the end right here so good work good stuff right here everyone um and then remember you're going to talk about the y variable because we're always going to talk about like how we expect them to differ and why and then make sure to talk about units of the y because we're going to talk about the weight right here so we've got to practice these interpretations let's head back 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 to the kahoot <laughs> purple hawk flying into the lead right there let's see how the next one goes here we go quiz question leverage is what what is that leverage lots to read on the screen right here I don't want to give it away. What is leverage? What makes something unusual in its leverage? Leverage only concerns itself with one one type of variable. The other thing, deleted studentized residual, deals with residuals, which is the actual minus predicted. The deleted version of it. Yep, I, I think we're pretty good on this one. Uh, leverage, another wow, is how far observations are from the mean of the X's. Back off, rapid zebra, back off. This is my game right here. <laughs> so if something is unusual in the X's, then it has leverage. So these are <laughs> words. I know I'm so sorry, but make sure HD is on. Uh, if you want to see if your variables have leverage or if things have leverage, you want to go over here to influence plot and influence plot of your model will show you the points with le Oh my God, what have we done right here? Well, my highest leverage point is right here, which means this is really far away from the mean of the X's. But this point right here is just a big planet. This is the size of the influence. Uh, this point over here does not have a big, big enough deleted studentized residual to have enough uh, influence, which influence means a combination of leverage and deleted studentized residual. So that means these areas right here, this area right here, and this area right here are the influential areas. The bigger the circle, also the bigger the size of the influence. But we generally like to point out where we see heavy undue influence. And there's a lot of points, uh, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. That means this is the 12th uh, observation right here, our 12th element of a vector. This is the 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th, and 17th. There are 17 total points with undue influence. Uh, one ridiculous point right here, and I should probably narrow down what that point is if I'm doing further observations on this data, but that point right there almost is a special consideration. These other ones have similar undue influence and kind of balance out, but that one's just a ridiculous, ridiculous point. Let's see, did you catch the other topic, the deleted studentized residual? I'm guessing. Oh, look at Rapid Zebra versus Lovely Hamster. This is a close game. $20 first prize, $10 second prize. Make sure to email me afterwards. Send the Amazon gift card your way. Quiz question, here we go. Deleted studentized residuals are, as I delete myself, what is a deleted studentized residual? So try and narrow it down quickly right here. What is a residual? Remember residual wrap, actual minus predicted? So a residual is just the actual minus the predicted. So we got a lot of people saying the difference between a point and its prediction, this is a residual. That is that is just what a residual is. It's the actual minus the predicted, that's a residual. But when we do a deleted residual, we are removing the point. So if the point were to pull the line down, we remove it and it actually makes the residual larger. So it's a way to kind of, oh no, Blake, it's all right, man. It's all right, man, you got this. Keep working hard, you got this. Great job being in first for a good while there. Um, the deleted studentized residual rem residual moves removes the point's influence. Now we say studentized. What what are we saying when we say studentized? What the heck is this whole studentized thing right here? It allows us to do something, which then we know if, if it's odd. I'll never make you use this formula for leverage. It's like two n minus k over n or something. I don't know. I see it all the time. You don't gotta memorize it. it. Solves it for you. It's just where high leverage is. Some statistician figured that out. That's where high leverage is at exactly trace man positivity right there trace some 20 points place trace throwing out some positivity why why do we studentize it why do we studentize the deleted residual like what the heck does studentize mean I, I try not to memorize what things are called like delete studentize residual i mean we should know that but instead of just memorizing it like what the heck does that mean 
what does it mean that we're studentizing it? What's the point of that? Like, why are you doing that? What's the point of doing that? It's basically standardized. Yep. That's exactly it right there. Aisha and I have another 20 points. Thank you so much. Great answers right there. It's basically standardizing it because then we can say it's odd. Uh, so we can kind of a rule book, a, like a standardized version of it. Exactly. And then we can make this standard right here. If it's greater than two, it's odd. And if it's less than negative two, it's odd. So by studentizing it, and it's called studentized because it's related to student T, basically it's just standardized. Uh, might as well just be called deleted standardized residual. If you called it that, we should just be like, cool. Yeah, it's the same thing. Um, but studentized refers to the student T distribution. So it's studentized. Thank you, William Gossett, for that right there. Uh, I think William Seeley Gossett. I don't know. That's his name. Well, let's go back here and take a look. So outside of two and negative two is odd, just like your 68, 95 classic stats right there with some stat 201. Here we go. Oh my gosh. What? Put on a little music right here. A little craziness just happened on the leaderboard. Shining hamster jumping in the lead right here. Next question. Here we go. What is the reference month of the year? Who knows the reference month of the year? Any ideas on this? Reference month of the year. What is that? Oh, we got one January. No, it's all right. It's all right. How'd you know that what the, was the reference month of the year? How did you know that? When you look for reference with categorical X's, this specifically refers to a categorical X. And we're seeing the same thing over here in this output. References deal with categorical X's. I mean, technically, logistic has a reference, but I don't like to talk about reference with logistic because the level of interest is last. And we do more about predicting the level of interest uh, versus like a reference level, alphabetical order. So anytime you're doing reference, uh, you'll see right here, we, we don't see ambidextrous because ambidextrous is the reference level. So you have handedness can be left, right, or ambidextrous. It looked like that was my right, but my mirror image right now. Um, so it can be left, right for you or ambidextrous. And um, but Brian doesn't know his left from his right. L remove teaching now. My teaching license is gone. I don't even have a teaching license. They're going to get me. Ah, I'm gone. Okay, time to Brian's beard now. Okay, time to Brian knows his left. See, Brian? Right, ambidextrous. There we go. Thank you, Tony Brian. So the first alphabetical order is what, uh, how we choose the reference level. It's pretty arbitrary. As you can see up here, gender male is the indicator. Um, and then how many levels of handedness are there? Easy question right here. How many levels of handedness are there? We've already answered this multiple times so far, but we just need to make sure we know it like this. We just got to make sure we'd be like, boom, there's that many levels of handedness. <laughs> You're welcome, Michaela. There's three. Why don't you see the other one? Tiny Brian always returns. He always returns. Where's my parrot at? Where's my parrot? Oh, get my parrot. Good little guy. Oh, thank you, little guy. Parrot here. Yeah. Tiny Brian parrot. Tiny Brian. Oh, woo! <laughs> Uh, Teddy Brown's parrot. You need to go away, parrot. Okay. Exactly. I think everyone's getting it right there. We just have a little bit of fun right here. Um, there are three levels to this, and it creates two indicator variables, and it's when the other variables are equal to zero. Exactly. So you have to plug in a zero right here. So the reference level really doesn't have a coefficient. Its coefficient's the same as the intercept. So the intercept would be here. Uh, like the value of the intercept represents the desired weight, which this is a complete extrapolation of the model. The intercept would represent the desired weight of females because we have to go here when gender male is equal to zero. The desired weight of females is negative. The desired weight for females who have zero height, zero weight, zero GPA, zero, 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 who are ambidextrous because we set these equal to zero. So you don't want to say, you just don't want to interpret like hand in his left zero but it, it does mean that we're, the indicator is not on. So we're indicating they're not left-handed. They're not right-handed. So if you're not left-handed, you're not right-handed, you have to be ambidextrous. So kind of a good talk on that right here uh, on how indicator variables work. And they tell us whether or not something is. And April would be the reference level, which we would not see in the model right there. The model would just not have that variable. Cool. Let's do it. Ooh, leaderboard's locked up. Will it stay this way? I don't know. Only a few more questions. We were predicting whether or not someone buys a stock. Which of the following is true? Whether or not someone buys a stock. 
Oh. Now there's technically a right answer, two right answers, but I don't like it. Don't, don't you remember what we're doing here? We're doing logistic. We're predicting if someone buys a stock. So what do we really care about? I'm sorry if you pick the other answer and you say, but technically, Brian, and I say, but technically, I don't care about that. <laughs> it's going to use all the voices. So why is it that? Why is it that? In logistic, the what, what, what? Someone put it in the chat earlier today. They were like, L, L, L. And that's what you need to remember. In logistic, the level of interest is last. So we're going to predict whether or not someone buys the stock, yes or no. And so we're going to predict the probability of someone buying the stock. So, and we, we can do this with many, many different models. Let's go take a look at that right here. So logistic is reverse. Exactly. LLL, logistic level interest to last. You do have to like take your mind, flip it upside down. I'll tell you how I built this logistic regression. I'm done. <laughs> um, so let's bring up the diabetes data set. Ah! There we go. And let's take a look. There it is, diabetes. And let's go to glucose. Logistic hates your guts. <laughs> important stuff for tonight's assignments right here. Um, very important for tonight's assignment. Very important for tomorrow. Um, family equals binomial. <laughs> Justin, you kill me, man. Okay, there we go. Who can interpret? Let's throw another uh, one minute on the clock. Timer one minute. Interpret this coefficient in this regression. Here we go. You can't even see it. There's the coefficient. You know what would help? Mara, we are predicting probability of yes, someone having diabetes. So interpret the coefficient and just look at it. See if what you say makes sense when you look at this. There's the coefficient. Take a moment right here. This is the practice. We always need to be practicing our interpretations. Writing them in the chat is the best way to make sure you know how to do it. So if you're looking at this model right here, we have two individuals who differ in their level of glucose by one unit. Or you could just say two individuals differ in their glucose, the person with higher... I don't want to say the little thing. Look right here. Are you going to say this number? No, you're not going to say that number because this is logistic. The only thing to care about right now is the sign. So what do you got? What do you got? Let's see. Let's see some practice right here. This is the good practice. For two individuals who differ in glucose by one unit, the person with higher glucose is more likely to have diabetes. Boom! Kirsten right there again. Everyone 100 points. It's these Mega Monday points. Right there, Kirsten on these Mega Mondays. Now, Kirsten, I want to ask something. When you read your interpretation right there, and Preston, great job too. I think he's got a two people. Oh, and then we don't we don't technically need the otherwise identical. I wouldn't count off points on that because it's not a multiple. I would not count off points, Preston, but technically we don't need it because it's not a multiple, but I would not count off points. Two individuals that are otherwise identical who differ in their levels of glucose, the individual with higher glucose is more likely to have diabetes. Two people who differ in glucose by one energy, yeah, whatever our glucose is, I'm not going to be too crazy about that. The person with higher glucose is more likely to have diabetes. Yep. Is this, when you read over your answer, does it make sense to you what you're saying? Like when I said, if I said to you, you know, two individuals who differ in their glucose by one unit, the person who has higher glucose we see is more likely to have diabetes. I'm just telling you there's a positive relationship here. When you read off your answer, make sure it makes sense. I read a bunch of, and it's all right. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to pick on anybody. I'm not trying to be mean. Not trying to be mean to you. I just read some answers and I'm like, what are you thinking? Ah! <laughs> There's like two bunny rabbits that differ in their probability, yes, of glucose, differ in their diabetes glucose by 0 0.04. And I'm like, what? I'm like, wow. Hold on. So it, it's all right. Just read over it. <laughs> 20 points goes out to Ivan. Uh, no, I hope not, Ivan. Don't worry. You kill me there, Ivan. <laughs> I'm sorry, Ivan. I swear I'm not talking about Ivan. I swear, Ivan, I'm not talking about you. 
<laughs> let's go to the next question. Let's do this. Oh, shining hamster. Battle of the hamsters versus the deer. Can the hamsters take down the deer? Let's find out. On the next episode of BS 320. When we predict a categorical why, we, what method must we use? Categorical why. Your world flipped, turned upside down. I'll tell you how I made this categorical why regression here. Using... Uh, I don't know. Oh, no. Categorical why just changes everything pretty majorly. Started on Friday, finished it today. Review it tomorrow. Yep, logistic. Yep. Linear is a quantitative Y, so we can fit the line. We, we can't fit the non-sigmoidal curve to it. A lot of good notes on this today, especially. Uh, we also went over this on Friday. But uh, da, 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 da. so please, 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 please review this. Uh, because there's major changes right here to where we're no longer fitting the line, which is quantitative Y. You can see right there, a quantitative Y scale. And then um, over here, you're predicting the probability, which is not a constant change if we're using height to predict probability of male. And the graphic will show us what we are predicting right here. And we can see here two beetles that differ in the dose of poison they get by one unit of dose of poison. The beetle that gets the higher dose of poison is less likely to be alive. We also see that here with the negative coefficient in the uh, output that uh, the higher dose of poison would be associated with beetles being less likely to be alive on average in the long run. Because it's about not one beetle, it's about the the trend in the data we see that we would expect beetles that get higher doses of poison. And that's what our thing's trying to do with those MLEs, trying to reproduce the data. Oh my gosh, who's in the lead? I do not know. It is a close, close game right here. Let's find out. Hamsters versus deer. Be quick. I don't know. Don't be quick. Be careful. Be quick. Be careful. Two more questions. AIC, if you've done the review quiz, you know the answer to this. I don't think I'll put this on the test, but if you've done the review quiz, this is an answer to a review quiz question. If you've done the review quiz, you know this. I want to point out a cool thing about this. We won't go too big in detail on this. This is not on the test. I'm going to remove it because uh, I don't want to put something on the test. Let's know you haven't done it. It's such a great measure and I don't get to talk about Akeike. Ah, this is on the review quiz. It's a pretty good thing to mention and this is the answer to it. How close our model is to the truth. AIC, let's put it on... I might, I might, I'll, I'll see. I got to finish up the test tonight. I've got a, oh, I got a lot to do. Sorry, the video labeling will take a while today. I've got groceries pick up, got tests to finish up. Uh, <laughs> it's a big day. Ah, starting class on Wednesday. Ah, okay, we're all good. Everything, everything's fine. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. <laughs> Thanks, Simon. <laughs> it's fine. Like, you know, it's, I think we've all done this before. We're like, okay, big thing right here. I, I did a lot of work on the weekend to prepare for everything. And this morning I was getting ready for class and I was like, I haven't had my coffee. I did have my second cup. And so I was like, I was like 15 minutes before. Well, thank you, Trace. I appreciate that. And I want to say great job to everyone in the class. It's a tough class. It's a quick period of time. And so um, you're working as hard as I am, and I appreciate that. Like, we're all working together. Like, we keep talking about, I'm running that marathon beside you. Sometimes you're cheering me on. Sometimes I'm cheering you on. We're in this together. We got this. Uh, AIC, Akai Ike's information criteria. Let's just give shout-outs to the amazing man. Unfortunately, he's passed away. Um, Akai Ike. Um, he's a Japanese statistician. And Dr. Humphreys Bosdogan... Um, let me go to AIP, AIC Wikipedia. Okay, UK's information criteria. And actually, so let me go back to here. Let me bring it over to the main screen. Uh, so here he is. Here is Hoga Ake Ike. Um, and Dr. Humphreys Bosdogan studied underneath. Uh, make, Brian, you made me feel like I could live. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Blake. I appreciate that. Uh, this might actually be, and no joke, this might actually have been at UT. Uh, they did a, eh, probably not. He tried a lot of other photos. He came to UT to be honored at UT. Oh, thank you, Kirsten. Like, thank you so much. Uh, but Dr. Humphreys Bosdogan, who is another, let me bring up Humphreys Bosdogan. Um, Hum Bosdogan. Here we go. Let me bring us all over here. Humphreys Bosdogan 
uh, learned under Dr. Akaike. So if you go to his biography, uh, should be talk about when he went to Japan and he has the coolest, he told me the full story. Thank you, Ivan, right there. Uh, but Akaike is a super influential person and probably Dr. Bosdogan, this is 1971. He was about my age. You guys are awesome. Thank you, Aisha. Uh, he went and studied in Japan after getting his PhD with Dr. Akaike and has continued the research. Uh, he's gotten some huge awards, very important, you know, person in our department. So Dr. Humphreys Bosdogan, amazing, amazing work. And he worked for this guy. Uh, oh, Rachel and everybody, you guys are making me blush. Um, but Dr. Akaike, his paper has 1,400, 14,000 citations. Uh, his, at this time when they, it was the 73rd most research, 73rd most cited research paper of all time. And then they don't even, it hasn't even been like updated here. It, it just oftentimes it's not even, people don't even cite him. It's his work, but it's like so common now that people are just like, they're like, oh, it's AIC. It's just how close our model is to the truth. And we can use it for model selection. You know, what's really, really interesting is if we go here and if we make a model and you guys are so awesome. Thank you. I appreciate all the positivity. I'm here running that race beside you. Do I know how to spell insulin? I do. Watch this. Choose order. And if we use the AIC criteria, the AIC criteria would suggest this model right here. And you know what's really interesting? So this is the AIC. And this is a good review also. Here's the AIC right here, which says we should use, and it's the lowest AIC because it's the closer our model is to the truth. Rose, you're awesome too. Thank you. So you guys are just playing my angle being so nice. Uh, the lower the AIC, the closer it is to the truth. A difference of two is very small. A difference of 10 is much larger, but still the smaller the AIC, the better. And you know what's really interesting? Use your method that you already know. The method we already know is to go to the highest R squared adjusted, subtract 0.005, and then see if the smallest model meets the standard and the smallest model meets the standard. So the method by which Dr. Petrie created right here using the 0.005 standard actually converges with uh, Dr. Akaike's, and that's another, uh, AICC is for smaller models, more talk about with AICC. It's it's still just AIC, but it's a, an additional calculation for additional penalty. Uh, so AIC is just how close our model is to the truth. Doesn't really have any practical interpretation, but can be used to do model comparisons. Lucy, so good to see you right here. Thank you so much, Lucy. You are totally right, and we're finishing up. Lucy, I meant to have you on to promote the Discord. We're doing a lot more with the loose with the Discord. So happy to see you. We're throwing out a hundred points for a random Lucy appearance right here. You, I think you appear at the start of the semester and you're appearing at the end. Tomorrow's their last day. If you want to throw them, uh, oh, she made, did she make some study guides? If so, Lucy, you should send me those too. I could post them. Lucy, if you have some really great study guides for like 320, then you should send them to me and I could try to make them more available um, and all that good stuff right there. So feel free to do that. I, Lucy did extremely, well, I can't say, but if you know, if, you, if you're seeing some study guides from Lucy and they're helping you out, then maybe. So thank you right there for your contributions. Um, <laughs> I love having former students swing by. It is an honor to me. Thank you so much, Lucy. I appreciate it so much. It's an honor to see you here. And I hope your summer is going well. I don't know if you're taking classes or whatever. Lucy, do you want to cheer everyone? We're on the final question right here. We're going to turn on a little fun music right here. Of course, our hacker music. Let's do it right here. Turn on a little music. Here we go. Last question. Let's win right here. Thank you so much. Oh, wait. Oh, my gosh. It's going to be a crazy last question right here. Here we go. I forgot you hadn't seen the haircut yet. Linear regression does which of the following? Linear regression. Linear. It can do a lot of things. You say, well, Brian, can't it do this anyway? What is it going to do? Is it my time to announce the winner? Not yet, Tony Brian. Soon. Soon. Oh my God. Just predict a quantitative ride was here the whole time. So let's see who won. The winner. Well, we gotta go third place. Here we go. Quantitative Y. That's what linear regression does. Here, I'll show you. Watch, take a look. This is logistic. This over here, that's linear. That's a line. That's a logistic. That's a line. Line. Logistic. Line. Logistic. 
sigmoidal curve live. Honey Brian got his haircut too. Well, I know we're talking about Honey Brian's haircut. Where my puppet shark at? Puppet shark? Okay, let's do this. Let's get serious. Stop goofing around, Brian. Here we go. The winner of third place, which you get our kudos. Here we go. Third place goes out to Rapid Zebra. Woohoo! I like parrots. Shining Hamster. Tiny Brian, he'll, he'll, he'll be adopted. And Lovely Hamster. All those hamsters. All those hamsters doing a great job. Great job, hamsters. Burp, burp. Burp, where are you going? Oh my god, burp. Burp. He likes shiny hamster. Burp. Burp, no! Okay, burp. What are you doing? What are you doing, burp? Burp. Burp, burp, burp. What are you doing? You going to run? You going to run? Burp, 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 burp. Hamster sweep it. Tiny Brian has to go away now. Tiny Brian away. He's weird. So if you came in first or second, let me know. Make sure to email you mean GeForce. GeForce. <laughs> if you came in first or second, make sure to email me. Every question was answered correctly by most players. Great job. Amazing review. I know we, we we had like a fourth of the class here. I'll still take it. I'll still take a minute of a fourth of 201 showed up to these things. Oh my gosh. We'd have like three, 400 students playing. Sometimes we hit 200, but Brian's having way too much. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Great job. So good seeing you, Lucy. Can we go over all the interpretations? Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, let's go over some interpretations right here. Hey, there's the 201. Okay, let's take a look. It's going to take me a while to label the videos tonight. Gonna go work out, gonna go pick up groceries, gonna uh, finish up the test, labeling videos. Sorry, there's gonna be a delay on that today. So when you go back to that T and voice review, it'll be like, he doesn't label videos. <laughs> he did not label the videos when I was trying to study. Worst teacher ever. Don't do that, please. I'm sorry, apologizing now. Okay. Let's talk about linear regression. Uh, linear regression right here has in it da, 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 da. linear regression. We need to make sure we understand that we have quantitative Y at all times. So linear regression is quantitative Y. Lucy's cheat sheets might be better than mine. I do not know. And when we do a linear regression right here, we need to know if something is it going to be a quantitative X or categorical X. So quantitative X is when we have um, two, let's put a two individuals who differ in X by one unit are expected to differ in Y by B1 units where the higher X is expected to have a higher slash lower Y. I think it's got it right there. <laughs> Preston's killing me. <laughs> Preston, some toy boys are there throwing some jokes in the chat right there. Um, and and you want to read off your interpretations to see if they make sense. Uh, da, 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 da. and the expected are key. Never use the word will. Uh, higher x. Here, we'll look at one of these really quickly right here. So this is a quantitative X right here with a l linear regression. And so I think we have some of these up already. Da -da 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 -da. Here we go. Uh, yeah, 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 we got one right here. Uh, so let's look at the visualization of this model. Ooh, there's some heteroscedasticity. Check regression is going to come back bad on that. Uh, but we have here two individuals. And I don't have to say are otherwise identical because this is not a multiple. But two individuals who differ in their, I'm trying to fix something real quick. Two individuals who differ in their glucose level by one unit of glucose are expected to differ in their insulin, because that's the Y, insulin, by 2.238 units of insulin, um, where the person who has more glucose is expected to have higher insulin. So very important right here, we notice that there is a positive linear trend right here, and we make that clear. We're also talking about two individuals. You don't want to say anything like, Higher insulin, higher glucose means you have higher insulin. We're talking about the differences we observe between individuals and what we expect. 
This model does look to have problems, decent R squared, R squared adjusted, since it's a simple model, it doesn't need to be really looked at. Now, one caveat I want to put up here at the start and put in red. If multiple, otherwise identical. So this is like a global thing right here. This is a global, uh, as in any time we do a multiple, this will switch. So if I change my model right here to tilde dot and I analyze glucose now, the only change to my interpretation of glucose would be two people, which it's not quite this small now, but two people who are otherwise identical, who differ in their glucose by one unit of glucose are expected to differ in their insulin by 2.17 units of insulin, where the person who has higher levels of glucose is expected to have higher levels of insulin. Does everyone see the small switch right here that you just add in this otherwise identical or among otherwise identical individuals? We should be who in that first line? Oh, uh, oh my gosh, Preston right there, some 50 points. Thank you for catching that. Uh, yeah. Preston, great catch on the error right there. I just did that. So, you know, Preston, I was just seeing if anyone was watching. I was like, man, no one's watching. So Preston, great job right there. Good catch. And thank you very much. I was obviously just doing it. Right? <laughs> categorical X. Let's do some categorical X. It's basically going to be the same thing. Let's watch out though. Um, if I copy it, I'm going to make an error. Two individuals where one is reference level and the other is indicator level. The person who is indicator level is expected to be B1, whatever it is, units higher slash lower than reference level. Okay. And make sure to throw in your otherwise identical. Where one is reference level, this needs to be interpreted right here. And the other is indicator level. The person who is indicator level, because we're interpreting their coefficient, because the reference level has no, no coefficient. Is expected to be B1, whatever the coefficient is of it. Higher slash lower, you need to pick from there. Then the reference level, because we're talking about differences. The indicator shows us differences from the reference level. ACT, who would be whom? Oh, really? Two individuals whom differ? I, I, I don't mind. Is it? Yeah. Two individuals where one is reference. Yeah. Oh, man. ACT, I'll fail it right now. <laughs> Give me the ACT. I'll fail it. Okay, so here we go right here. We have to do otherwise identical right here because this is a multiple regression. But two individuals who are otherwise identical, remember we're predicting someone's insulin levels. Uh, two individuals who are otherwise identical. <laughs> when we say B1 units, are we just saying what the units are? So this is in units of uh, insulin right here. Does that make sense right there, Trace? This is in units of insulin. So whatever this is right here, this is not in units of diabetes, yes. This is, yeah, here, I'll go back to it in two seconds right here, Blake. Um, so, and I'll interpret this and I'll go back to the interpretations again. This is not in units of diabetes. Yes. All of these coefficients right here are in units of Y, which is in units of insulin. So two individuals where one person does not have diabetes and the other person does have diabetes. The person with diabetes is expected to have insulin levels that are 6.211 units lower than they're otherwise identical. So two individuals who are otherwise identical. But one person has diabetes, yes, and the other person has, does not have diabetes. The person with diabetes is expected to have insulin levels that are 6.211 units lower. Um, is that making sense right here? Two individuals with one is reference, the other is indicator. The person who is indicator is expected to be B1 units higher or lower than the reference. Um, and that should be right right here, right? Have I made any issues or errors on this? Does anyone see anything? So I'm just doing these off the top of my head. I mean, this is generally what you see in the notes too, but kind of doing it more structured so you can see it right here. Is this making sense here, Blake? You got a five on oh, you got a five total. That was like a five out of five. ACT's out of like 36 or something. I did all right on the SAT, not on the SAT verbal. So I'm <laughs> deleting that off, Preston, since you got a five. <laughs> oh, let's switch this up right here. Logistic. Logistic has a uh, categorical X, categorical Y. Can't even think. Categorical Y. And da, 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 da. quantitative X. Uh, let's put a big note right here. Don't mention value 
mention sign. Okay. So what are we talking about right here when we say don't mention the value, mention the sign. Let's decrease one on that a little bit here. It's a little helpful note right there. Don't mention the value, mention the sign. So Brian, what are our two check regressions for multiple? Ah, we'll do that next year, Blake. We'll do that next year, Blake. So um, I can show that here next in just a second. We did an off-star save. I'll show that after we get done with this right here. So great question, Blake. Uh, so a categorical X, uh, two individuals who differ in X by one unit uh, are expected... Mess that up. Is this more likely? Oh, more or less likely. Okay. And make sure so level of interest needs to be interpreted. More or less likely needs to be decided upon based on the sign. You know what we'll do? We'll highlight this in red to make sure right here uh, with the higher level of X. So a higher level of X needs to be interpreted. Uh, two individuals, be careful on this. I should have been highlighting two individuals. Uh, like there needs to be context on this. I kept putting two individuals here and I should watch out. I'm going too static on that two individuals. It depends. Are we talking about, you know, widgets? What are we talking about here? Shouldn't it be logistic regression instead of linear? Oh, that's yeah. We should be careful on that. Copy paste. Uh, another 50 points right there. Catch an error trace. Thank you. Please catch the errors as Brian second cup of coffee wears down please catch the errors right there good great so it is a logistic as a categorical why very good catch right there and two individuals is not static it can be widgets it can be whatever we're predicting upon whether it be football teams or anything like that or whether it be tables at a restaurant uh just depends on the context of what we're talking about so now when we do a logistic we want to predict something like diabetes right over here so we're pretty much just going to switch out the variable right here and we can see some new coefficients Oh my gosh, we didn't go GLM and we did not go family equals binomial. You can do it in quotes, that works. And choose order is not going to work. We'll just ignore that. And here we go. We're looking at the model predicting diabetes and we are using MLEs, maximum likely estimates. And like then we had to interpret not the R output, but the functions will be the same. No, I don't think there's any function interpretation. Good question right there, Aisha. Great question. No function interpretation. Um, and the, except for the AIC question is the only question that goes outside the bounds. I did want to talk about AIC today, but it's on, and the answer is out there pretty much. And you get to see your answers. So I think the review quiz is very fair, but I'm not going to put it on the test. Maybe we'll look at some bonus on the test. I'll look at some bonus here as I finish it off tonight. Um, so da, 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 da. what's interesting is pregnant is a quantitative variable. And so two individuals here, um, so these are individuals they are of the Pima tribe. So two individuals who are otherwise identical, it's multiple regression, uh, where one person has been pregnant more than the other, the person who has been pregnant more is more likely to have diabetes. You can do the same thing. Could you explain the confusion? Yeah, here we'll do those things next. Yep. You got it, Rose. I think Blake and Rose have questions lined up after this. We got one more version to do after this. And unfortunately, we don't have, um, I'm going to have to code in a new variable right here. I'm going to go right here and code a new variable because I want a variable to interpret. If else, um, Pima age greater than or equal to 40, sure. Old, young. I'm still young. Turn this into a factor. See if this works. Cool. Go to Pima data set. Apply on to here age group. Okay. Okay, let's go look at our summary. And wow, we got an age group variable. It's got probably got some collinearity because I created it from another variable. And yeah, it's got some collinearity, not the worst. Okay. So we now have a age group variable. We have an age group variable. And this can break into the last one. And we increase some multicollinearity of this problem. But does everyone see right here two individuals who are otherwise identical? Uh, the individual who would be older would what? And this kind of makes sense when we look at these two interpretations. Among two individuals who are otherwise identical, the individual who is older is what? Diabetes. Because we're predicting diabetes, yes. We'll look at the confusion matrix for this after this too and check regression on it too. So what would we have right here? Who could write the interpretation? Let's throw one minute on the clock, throw on some classic music. One more chill music. 
<laughs> I'm showing this. Can anyone interpret this coefficient? I kind of did it a few times, but can you? Using our interpretations on the screen, for like two individuals who differ by one unit of X, the individual with a higher level of X is more or less likely to be the level of interest. So can you interpret this coefficient? Can you do it? How do we interpret that? I just get to listen to music right now. So what you're doing right now is you're, you're seeing this is a logistic model because we got GLM family binomial. And so the model is not actually being displayed over here. The model would look something more like uh, this right here. Not quite like it because that's a simple logistic regression. Given two individuals that differ in age by one year, the older individual is more like, boom, HDT crushing it. HDT just got everyone 50 points right there. HDT, another former student just crushing it with that knowledge. Also Trace jumping in right there. Two individuals who otherwise I know who differ in age by one year, the individual with the higher age is more like a diabetes. HGT, so glad to have you here. Last semester, right? You just took 320, right? Throwing in that knowledge, someone like, Psh, I don't know how to interpret some, some coefficients in a logistic regression. Great job right there, HGT. Good to have you swing by and everything. We're just random students swinging by, doing some practice, making sure they understand it still, getting some points for everyone. So that is a, my God, I got nine messages on Discord. <laughs> Discord's blowing up. So let's go to, okay. So now we have a categorical X. Hope your summer's going well, HTT. Do, do, do. And let's be careful right here. Let's just throw on a little. I like I like this song too. Just chill. Two individuals. We gotta grab the other one. Uh where one is reference. I'm gonna do a style copy. Is that do it? Style copy. Going well, awesome. Oh, you got this, HTT. You're good on this. You got it. Saw a notification on my other accounts. Yes. Somebody anytime. It's I saw it's it's easier when like I see students to know who they are. But then like I HTT and stuff and Lucy swung by. So I'm always happy to see former students in the chat. What do we got right here? We're interpreting this coefficient. Let's do another 50 points on the line, finishing it off right here. And then we'll talk about the uh, confusion matrix. We'll talk about the check regression on this. So now we've got a categorical X because I created an age group variable. Oh, no, those answers were correct. Mm -hmm. This was a quantitative. So two individuals, this coefficient right here, don't mention the value. Two individuals who differ in their age by one year, the individual, because we're predicting probability of diabetes, yes. This is not quite the curve, but it does have a positive coefficient. Um, two individuals who are otherwise identical, but one is older than the other. They differ in age by one year. The person who is older is more likely to have diabetes. And so take a look at Trace's answer and HGT. They would get full points on the test for that. Do not mention the coefficient value. So when you see this right here, we have age group young and age group old. So it kind of goes along with the same interpretation, although not statistically significant, thus helping out with the null deviance, but don't worry about that. Just what does the coefficient mean right there? And it'd actually be sigmoidal down now. We're predicting probability of yes for diabetes. Have we played this one lately? That's too serious. Let's play this one again. Two individuals who are otherwise identical, because it's a multiple. Two individuals who are otherwise identical, but one is what and the other is what? The individual is what? Two individuals where one is old and the other is young. The individual is young is yes. And you're only missing one thing, Trace, which you'd probably get 2.5 out of 3 on that. Missing one small thing. So close. Missing one small thing right there. We'll break it up a little bit more. There's that section. Because it's a multiple. So, it, because you might say, well, what if this person uh, has lower glucose? And you're like, oh, wait, wait, they're otherwise identical. They're like, this. they're like, we clone the person. Exactly, Rose, great job right there. We clone the person, and then we can say they're otherwise identical. Theoretically, like they might exist. Practically, sometimes it doesn't make sense to say otherwise identical because it's like, well, can you really have otherwise identical individuals where one is old and the other is young? You know, but they, because technically then their age wouldn't be the same. So technically you'd be altering their age 
which they do the high multicollinearity. So it's what the coefficient means, but sometimes practically speaking, it might not work. Um, like, could I really exist? Like when we talk about Brian and changing his BMI and all these things, could I exist and be otherwise identical if I, you know, I don't know. Theoretically, it's just what the coefficient means. The math, the math doesn't try to exist in reality. But when we do the check regression, which is a good question, let's go ahead and talk about the check regression. So the whole point of this, when we check regressions, is we're asking, are, wow, wow. I need to raise the sound effects. I worked so hard to put all these sound effects in and they're so quiet. They're fun. Where's my own Wilson? Wow. That's not where that's at. It's not a totally different thing. It just works. Yeah, this, this regression rate is pretty good. Uh, the check regression tells us if there's issues and there's no issues right here. There are no issues with this regression. Um, the p-value is high. Exactly. Look, Trace, HGT, great job reviewing and making sure you know it. Uh, there's no issues with this regression. This regression comes back telling us that the fit of the logistic curve is good and the fit of the logistic curve is good. Th these two friends can get mad at each other. They can disagree at times. It's all right if they disagree. I mean, you don't want them to disagree and then you just kind of choose for yourself. You're like, I'm going with my friend who agrees with me. Um, so when you look at the check regression, Oh, on this extra code. Check regression right here. You want high p-values because that means the logistic curve is a good fit. If you try to fit a logistic curve where you do not, which we have an example back here where we might try to fit a logistic curve where it's a bad idea. I'm gonna circle it. If you tried to fit a logistic curve to this data, I'm gonna circle right here. If you fit a logistic curve to this, what do you think the p-value on check regression would come back to? The p-value on this logistic right here would probably come back what? If you fit that flat line through that data, logistics probably gonna come out with a p-value of what? Like if your data has that shape to it and you try to fit it through, ah, uh, reverse it, reverse it. Remember, one means it's a good idea. One means like, hey, yeah, you pass. So it's gonna come back with a p-value of zero. Does that make sense? It's gonna come back saying, no, no, no. And that's what the p-value of zero means. It means that you reject that it's a good fit. Does that make sense, Trace? Like you start out believing it's good. And in this one, you would find evidence it's bad. Does, hopefully the visualizations make more sense that this would return a p-value of zero. If your data has a structure like this, where the points have this, this would come back with a higher p-value if, if your data is going through it. Like theoretically, if we're fitting, I drew another one earlier today. If you're fitting this sigmoidal cur curve through the data and it fits through it well, then your p-value for fitting this might be something like this right here. It's gonna have a very high p-value because it's telling you the sigmoidal curve fits through the data well. But to contrast that, if you find a low p-value, it's telling you that the sigmoidal curve is not the proper fit. And that's why these tests right here are called uh, goodness of fit tests to see if the curve or the, you know, like the line of the curve is a good fit through the data. So if it is a good fit, high p-value. If it is a bad fit, low p-value. We get high p-values here, very good fit. If your two friends disagree with each other, well, then you just have two statisticians who wrote tests that are disagreeing on if you should use it and uh yeah you just kind of you just say well i don't know do I, this one says good this one says bad it's hard to tell i don't know what to do hopefully they both come back saying yay they're both great and you're like hey curve's a good idea hopefully hopefully we can hope our models are good all models are wrong some are useful is this model useful let's look at the confusion matrix as a way to tell uh, our percent of accuracy on the model and we're telling people whether or not they have diabetes. So we're gonna predict for this individual that they have it and they don't. So maybe we're saying, hey, you should get on these uh, drugs or whatever. Brian, 3,000. <laughs> not 3,000, I know we'll keep giving away points here, but not 3,000. I know, right, Blake? You're close, man, you keep, you got it, man. You're doing excellent work right there, Blake. We put in all the bonus rounds. So not everyone will get to the next rounds and the next highest values. I can't give away 3,000, but we'll keep going. We'll give away some good bonus points tomorrow. So uh, we've been going pretty high with the bonus points. So keep working away at them. A great job on everyone on these points. Amazing work. And if you notice right here, you know what's interesting? Is I think, ah, you can do left arrow, right arrow. I don't like it. Let's call it Matt. No. Let's call it M1. Uh, M1, there we go. Um, you can just take the values. 
guess we could. Yeah, it's not going to do what I want. 1-1 one, one should be that value. Plus 2-2. Two, two. So we're adding those values right here. So what we get... Ooh, what did I do? Oh, I divided by the wrong thing. I don't know how algebra... Always look at your answer and see if it makes sense. These are the amount of people we predict correctly. Does this make sense? Now, when will we get our out the bonuses? I think we got it. I think we're at the bonuses. I'll have to plug it in probably tonight or tomorrow. I do like to plug those things afterwards so you see your grade go up because um, it's really nice when you're finishing this semester. Like, oh, my grade keeps going up. Yeah. But if your grade's already like maxed out, you're like, hey, Brian, are we getting more bonuses? Because my grade needs to go up. So I, I definitely wait till the end to put everything in and then uh, you see it all finalized. If you think something's not there, please tell me. There has been rare instances where I've forgotten. I've made mistakes. I've forgotten. I've miscalculated grades. I've calculated probably 10,000 grades at this point. So I make mistakes and I hope everyone's been caught. Like every mistake's been fixed. Um, I'm sure I've made a mistake that hasn't been caught and that's not good. It's just tough. 10,000 grades I've probably calculated like this semester alone or this year alone I've taught Last semester, I taught about a thousand students. <laughs> this summer already 300. This, no, 250, 260 this summer. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> um, so what we're looking at here is where we predict someone will not have diabetes and they actually don't have diabetes. And then we predict right here, someone will not have diabetes and they do. Ooh, that's a bad prediction. Because we're saying, I don't think you'll have diabetes. You, the model says you don't, but they actually do. That's a false negative right there. Type 2 error. Uh, right here, we see we predict someone would have it, and they do not. Type 1 error. And here we predict accurately that someone will have diabetes, and they do. The naive model is over here in the corner. Because the naive model doesn't care about these predictions. The naive model just looks at this right here. Um, so the naive model, which many of you might get, uh, might be able to make a naive model or a bad predictive model. Da, 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 da. No, I don't know if I have bad enough variables to do it. These are all good variables. This is the problem. Uh, let's just do this. Random. How big is the... So, random normal. This will be a bad variable. 392. Cool. Okay, and then let's just do random normal on it. Okay. So, this right here is a random variable. And I'm hoping it does just as bad as the model. Good to see you here, Alexis. And looking at the confusion matrix, it does. So if you get a confusion matrix like this, which some of you might be getting tonight, this is a model that doesn't do any better than the naive model. The line's probably going to be pretty flat. That's not the line. If we see the line here, go to the visualize on it. This is our model. It's pretty flat. I created a random variable that has no association. Any association is due by random chance. And thus we should see the p-value in the output should be very high also for it. So this is a random chance variable right here, as you can see by the p-value. And I just called it random. The line's very flat, indicating a very weak sigmoidal relationship. The stronger the sigmoidal relationship, the steeper the curve. And we can see right here, the model predicts the same as the naive. So it predicts everyone no. Because the majority level here is no, so everyone gets predicted no. We did see different models previously where we actually got predictions out of it. Once again, confirming that this over here is the naive. And so if you only see that, these are the totals, actually. It doesn't say totals. I wish it did. It should say predicted no slash total. I think that's got it. I've been going for about an hour and a half. I need to go and get some dinner and have some just, oh, man, groceries and everything. Woo! Woo! Put on a little music right here. Great job, everybody. I think everyone's had a big day of studying, working hard. I'll pack here a space. I'm going to take a break for a little bit here. Put back on the Marvel. And so I will take a break. I will be back, though. I'll be answering emails back tomorrow morning. And then we'll have office hours. I'll be finishing up, starting new classes. It's exciting. Remember, we can see the finish line. This is when we keep running. This is when we keep working. We've got this. We're almost done. Got 4th of July weekend coming up. We get the 5th off. You, I'm probably going to take it off too. So no no streaming. Just three days relaxed. You're welcome, Blake. Thank you, Blake, so much. And excellent work. So we got a break coming up here soon. Keep working hard. Don't overdo it. Don't want to train too hard. You're going to hurt yourself. Get some sleep tonight. Uh, just 
you got this it's all it's what your work is going to build up to you're welcome aisha excellent work so get some sleep tonight and get some good food relax and i'll see everybody tomorrow bye for now everyone bye, bye everybody you got this bye you too rachel